So they were not confident enough to say, but the median figure was that 14.6%. Now since then, um, I don't think there's been anything to change that scientific view. We've had an Australian systematic review at the end of 2007, which built on York as being the best, found a basket full of other studies, none of them good quality, despite York's plea for high quality research. And they said, uh, we, we endorse what it's found there. I think if there'd been anything startling, um, it would have been against the form book for a really good quality. It would have been noticed. But so far as one can see, those findings still principally stand. The reactions were very interesting to that. Um, I remember Jos Kleinen telling us in the, in the advisory board that whatever came out, you're not going to shift opinions more than a little bit along a, along a spectrum there. You can't expect suddenly to, to, for the world to be converted one way or the other. And it's, as I said, a topic where, where passions reign. Um, government endorsed it through gritted teeth. Um, they were shaken by some of the findings, but because it was plainly an excellently done exercise and because they'd funded it and agreed to it, they have stuck by it, at least so far as lip service goes. Um, it doesn't stop them still going back to old league table comparisons. A minister the other day was saying in the Commons, ah, but if you look at Sandwall, which is fluoridated, and Bolton, which isn't, you can see the difference there. The kind of stuff that York was designed to get away from. So they still very much stick to that. Um, on the professional front, I sometimes go into Blackwell's bookshop and look at the dental uh, textbooks just out of interest, and I see that the old evidence is still uh, produced. Not, not solely, a, f a few don't, but by and large it seems to me, on a small sample, that dental students are still being taught uh, that it benefits people by up to 50% and is, is, and is known to be safe. Um, the anti-people were disappointed that there weren't any proven dangers and still some of them behave as though there were. Um, so beliefs haven't changed all that much. There's an interesting um, comparison there. Um, just before York was done, the British Fluoridation Society, a promotional body which was funded by, part funded by government, said the survival of this fake controversy represents one of the major triumphs of quackery over science. Shortly afterwards, Trevor Sheldon, who chaired the review board, talked of the dearth of reliable evidence until high quality studies are undertaken after York, there will continue to be legitimate scientific controversy over the likely effects and costs of water fluoridation. So you've got the polarised views there. And what is also interesting is that after York, um, At the time it was just coming out, and the results were more or less known, the British Dental Association uh, said it's been proven beyond doubt to be safe and massively reduced decay, and there is no scientific controversy. Um, and the same thing was said more or less by the BMA spokesman, highly protective and very safe. Uh, the Audit Commission took its line, I think, from the dentist, MRC report, an all-party group. So Jos Kleinen was right, it didn't immediately or much since change people's opinions on that. Um, now, something that occurred to me halfway through and that I haven't seen people pick up is the missing out of a key question in this. And the um, benefit of these, as you say, is you can cover it up. Um, Key scientific question. You can know, you can even agree what the evidence is for a public health measure, but the question, is it good enough to give to all the people? That comes in a sense outside science, that's a societal thing. And one of the things I've tried to get people to do is to look at fluoridation itself and its own peculiarities and say, well, for something with these characteristics, would you be satisfied with this evidence, or this evidence, or this evidence? And so, 
you can compare it with, for example, you've got a GP who knows you, knows your history, follows you up, can tailor something one-to-one. -one. You've got other possible things I could have added to those three there. But my point is that unless you know, unless you can decide how strong the evidence needs to be, uh, then you can't really get a lot further and you're going to be arguing from different premises and at cross purposes. And the thing that I want to show, one of my key things about water fluoridation, and I don't think this is contentious, but I'd be happy to have holes picked in it. I don't like emotive language, but that seems to be an accurate description of what happens. And I think as a healthcare intervention, it's very, very unusual. Um, dentists talk about targeting populations, but it's actually scattergun to get to the, the handful of children whose teeth you're targeting. You, you, you target a conurbation of a million people. A lot of them can't benefit, their teeth are perfectly good or they don't have any teeth at all. That is where the ethics comes in and I think we won't have time to deal with it today. For me it's bog standard medical ethics, nothing to do with libertarian stuff and so on. Uh, be that as it may, um, there's no chance for informed consent with this. It doesn't have a medical license, we'll come to that in a minute. Is it a medicine, is it a food? You don't even have a controlled dose. You have as much of it as you drink. If you've got kidney problems, you'll drink more. Um, I've been told by one um, laboratory toxicologist that people who come to him drink somewhere between half a litre and ten litres a day. And that's a huge variation of the amount you get. You get it for a lifetime, nobody monitors you, and it's got, it goes out into the environment in the end. Um, and that leads us on, I don't have many of these overheads, but it leads us on to, that produces, I believe, six questions that need answering, six areas which need covering. There's an environmental one. Um, I read that Thames Water reckons that 30% of its water leaks out of the mains before it even gets to you. So fluoride would go out in that. Um, there's the ethical one, there's a legal one. We need to know if it's rightly not classified as a medicine or whatever it's classified as. There's the scientific, which I've dealt with insofar as we can today. There's a technical one, because things have gone wrong with the machinery in the plants of putting it in. You've got to get the concentration right there. And it's a very corrosive substance and you do get problems. Cost effectiveness, it, it is advertised as the most cost effective way of of um, dealing with teeth. Well, it, it may be, but if, if you're not sure about the effectiveness, you can't be all that sure about the cost effectiveness. Um, and York certainly considered that that was unproven. But that's why it's quite a big debate and we're not getting much of it uh, in the public arena and certainly not in the professional arena at present. Now then, Natural substance, artificial substance, poison. Well, it's natural and artificial. It's there in the groundwater anyway. And in some areas, up to, say, eight parts per million in India and, and uh, Texas, it does great damage and has to be taken out of the water in skeletal fluorosis. Um, so it's both of those at the appropriate time. Poison, well, funnily enough, it is that. I talked to a toxicologist who says that the listings in the Part 2 Poisons Act say that the type of hexafluorosilicic acid that's used for the artificial fluoridation does bring it within the realm of the Poisons Act. That has an implication that if it's not, say, a medicine, I, I have a friend or two who say, well then legally it ought to be handled under the Poisons Act, which it's not being, but I'm not competent to talk about that. Uh, medicine is one that I do want to have a look at and food is another. Um, and I'll tell you after that what the view is of some of the pundits on it. Um, but the medical definition comes from Europe and it's that. 